All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, and tonight, we're going to continue looking at the Bhikkhunivaga, the section of the nuns, uh, which is a part of the Samyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses of the Buddha. Uh, we started looking at this section a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is a little tiny collection of sutras. It's 10 little sutras, and they are all given um, by these nuns, these um, arahat, these awakened or, you know, enlightened nuns. Um, and so tonight, we are going to do at least, I hope we're going to do at least three more of these. But before I do that, let's kind of just, I want to it's not about reviewing the nuns that we've covered so far, but I do want to kind of make a point. So the first thing that I want to mention is that, you know, all 10 of these poems, they have the same format. They're, it's all about these encounters with Mara, the evil one. And it's about the way, the different ways in which Mara, the evil one, is trying to provoke or cause fear in our meditating nuns. And there's a way in which each of the nuns has a different, or Mara tempts the nun with a different thing. And what I wanna draw our attention to tonight really quickly is actually, it appears as if there's kind of a progression to these 10 nuns where like there's a, a buildup of ideas. So really quickly, I wanna mention the very first nun, Alavika is her name. And so she had gone off to the woods to meditate alone in seclusion. And that's when Mara comes up and tries to uh, basically cause fear in her to get her to give it up. And what he tells her, or you know, what he says to her, if I go back, he says, there is no escape from the world. So why don't you just enjoy yourself? And she says, no, there is an escape from the world. And that's what I'm doing out here. I'm not going to rehash or, you know, reiterate the whole po poem. But I do want to point out just something very, very simple, but very meaningful. And what it is, is that there's a way in which all of these poems, they're kind of dealing with aspects of doubt. And I wanted to just pause for a moment to reflect upon a certain doubt. And that doubt can take the form of, there is no end of suffering. It's just a natural part of life. So what I mean is, is that we don't need to be, you know, a, uh, a nun from 2000 years ago out in the woods. This is sort of about our practice and being faced with a certain kind of, um, you know, a, a kind of a nagging in the ear that is telling us this is all pointless. There is no escape from the world, just have fun. And of course, what the nun, Alavika, came to tell us, or what her poem is here to tell us, is no, there is an escape. And by her knowledge of that, she defeats Mara. Then we move to Soma, and the nun Soma was provoked by Mara but with a different idea. And that idea is ba basically, if I, if I could summarize, he said, Mara says to Soma, yeah, there is an escape, but only men can achieve it. And Soma's response is, what does male or female have to do with liberation? As far as I understand the Dharma, the Dharma is beyond male and female. And then again, Mara's like, oh, you got me. You know me. 
and then Mara is defeated, or at least Mara disappears in that sense. Then we come across, or we encounter our third nun, Gotami, who is tempted with this idea. And if you ask me, because basically Mara says to her, what are you doing all alone out here in the woods? Are you looking for a man? I don't think because the next nun is about kind of sensual or even sexual pleasure. I think we are to understand the third nun, Gotami, as being taunted with marriage. And this idea of like, what are you doing out here alone? You should find yourself a man and settle down. And once again, our nun counteracts that idea and defeats Mara or makes Mara disappear. And then our fourth nun, Vijaya, she is tempted with the five sensual pleasures. And Mara basically appears and says, hey, you're young, I'm young, let's have fun. And uh, Vijaya says, nope, I hand right back to you, Mara. I hand the, the sensual pleasures, I hand them right back to you. And so her sort of, renunciation and transcendence of the five sensual pleasures are then what sort of makes Mara go away. And then the last nun that we did last week, uh, Upa, Upa Lavanya, she was tempted with this, the fear of being all alone in the woods. And basically Mara is like, aren't you afraid that some rogue you know, some bandit is going to be out here in the woods and is going to kind of get you. And she says, bring them on. <laughs> I'm not even afraid of you, Mara. And that's where our Upa Lavanya, our master of the spiritual superpowers, says, I'm master of my mind. I could I could appear in your belly. I could stand between your your eyebrows and you wouldn't even know I was there. So I want to kind of want you to notice that as we've progressed, our last nun was a very powerful nun in that way, right? And so Mara tempting her with fear in that sense. All right. That kind of brings us up to speed. So tonight, I hope to talk about the next nun who is Chala and then her sister, Upa Chala and their sister, uh, Sisupa Chala. <laughs> I think I'm pronouncing those right. So these are three sisters, Chala, Upa Chala, and Sisupa Chala. And they all happen to be the younger sisters of Shariputra. So if you know the monk Shariputra, who's considered the foremost in learning, often um, represented or often shown in the sutras, teaching the Dharma, again, considered, you know, the foremost in wisdom in that sense. So apparently, I didn't know this backstory. I'm still learning all of my backstory. Um, but apparently, the three sisters of Shariputra eventually renounced and became nuns. And of course, each of them become arahats, these uh, enlightened women. And so we're going to start with Chala. So, oh, and by the way, all th so these three are the sisters of Shariputra, who's their older brother. And then of the three sisters, Chala is the oldest. And then Upachala, and then the very young Sisupachala. Okay, so let's see what Mara has to say to Chala. Once again, we're at Shravasti. Then in the morning, a bhikkhuni Chala dressed went into town, begged for food, and then came back. She sat down at the foot of a tree for the day's abiding, meditating. Then Mara, the evil one, approached the Bhikkhuni Chala and said to her, 
what don't you approve of, Bikuni? And she says, I don't approve of birth, friend. And then Mara says in verse, why don't you approve of birth? Once born, one enjoys sensual pleasures. Who now has persuaded you of this? Bikuni, don't approve of birth. Like, why don't you approve of birth? The Bikuni Chala said, for one who is born, there is death. Once born, one encounters sufferings, bondage, murder, affliction. Hence, one should not approve of birth. The Buddha has taught the Dhamma, the Dharma, that trans the transcendence of birth. For the abandoning of all suffering, he has settled me in this truth. As to those beings who fare amidst form and those who abide in the formless, not having understood cessation, they come again to renewed existence. Then Mara the evil one, realizing, oh, the bhikkhuni chala knows me, sad and disappointed, he disappeared right there. Okay, so what I want you to kind of, or what I was thinking when I was reading these and what I'd like to share with you is now Mara has kind of a, a different approach with Chala. In a way he's exhausted, or at least in terms of these poems and the, in terms of these, these sutras, he's exhausted He's tried sensuality. He's tried fear. He's tried the conventions of society. He's tried every kind of way to get these women to stop their pursuit of enlightenment or to stop their meditation, to stop their practice. And so with Chala, Mara asks, and, and this is, I'll just give you again the quote. He asks, what don't you approve of, Bikuni? And the other, I, I do not know Pali, so I'm not exactly sure of the word that's being translated as approve of, but reading the other translations, which also use that language, and then reading a bunch of studies and footnotes and all of that on this sutra, it seems that, the, that what Mara is basically asking is like, what's wrong? Like, what, what don't you like about this place? Why, like, why are you out in the woods meditating? What's, what don't you approve of in all of this? So that's the way that I read Mara's question. And again, he, he's tried tempting these women with sensuality. He's tried uh, scaring them out of it. And so now he's sort of seemingly at a loss. And he's just like, what, <laughs> what's, what's wrong with all of this? And she says, birth. <laughs> now, in other translations, they translate it as rebirth. And that's, it's, that's normal, but I just want to say a word about that. Whenever in the world of Buddhism, whenever you see the word birth, jati, whenever you see the word birth, there is sort of always the implication of rebirth in that way. Me, what, I, what I mean is, is that to say, and, and this kind of takes a little mental rearranging, in a Buddhist text or in a Buddhist context, to say birth, that could be in the past or the future meaning my birth, it could be my past birth that brought me into this situation or my future rebirth into my next situation. So because Buddhism is sort of predicated on a general understanding of reincarnation, we need to understand that birth is always understood to mean rebirth just as much as it means the initial birth. 
So you could read it either way that she doesn't approve of rebirth or doesn't approve of birth. I think it's actually interesting to kind of read it just as birth. And you could take that kind of any which way. And what I mean by that is, is that I think it's actually a really, um, what do I want to say? I feel like this is a very powerful statement coming from a nun who in a sense has, you know, has decided to put an end to giving birth as well as what they're kind of talking about in terms of attachment to birth or attachment to ideas of rebirth. So this is a very interesting one, I find, for this idea. So Mara asks, what don't you like about the world or what don't you approve of? And she says birth. And he says, how, how could you not approve of birth? Why don't you approve of birth? Once born, you get to enjoy sensual pleasures. But who now persuaded you of this, this, this idea to not approve of birth, right? And now, Chala, she says, for one who is born, there is death. Once born, one encounters suffering, bondage, murder, and affliction. That's why one shouldn't approve of birth. The Buddha has taught the Dharma, the transcendence of birth, for the abandoning of all suffering. The Buddha, he has settled me in the truth. So I want to focus, you know, this is one of those poems that we could definitely be here all night. There's a lot in here, but I just want to focus on this, you know, one particular statement about that the Buddha has taught the Dharma the transcendence of death. So I kind of mentioned this a lot. I feel like I may have even already mentioned it in this series, or I've mentioned it recently. And it's this idea that Buddhism, the Dharma, is about transcending birth and death. And this is why in the, at least in the in the earlier suttas, you often hear that Buddhism described as the teaching of the deathless. And the idea is, is, and you know, we've talked about this in last week and the week before, but it's about this really interesting idea of not immortality, not the idea of living forever and therefore no death. It's about the idea of actually transcending the categories, birth and death. The idea of transcending that very notion of one being born and being reborn in that sense. So she makes this statement that the Buddha has taught the Dharma, the transcendence of birth. For the abandoning of all suffering, he settled me in the truth. Now, what I think is really interesting about this, there's a lot of things going on here, but this teaching of birthlessness is a very important teaching that becomes kind of the foundation of Mahayana Buddhism in a lot of ways. I think the difference, if you know your dharma, meaning you know your Mahayana dharma, in the Mahayana, they will talk about all phenomena, everything and everything, which of course includes you, it includes me, it includes everything. But in the Mahayana, they talk about all dharmas not arising meaning not actually coming into existence the way we think. That idea, though, of the birthlessness of all phenomena, the birthlessness of all dharmas, you can kind of trace the origin of that concept, that Mahayana idea, 
you can trace it back to the Hinayana Sutras, where like a sutra like this, where Chala is talking about the transcendence of birth. Except I think that we are to understand Chala is talking about like mam mammalian birth, <laughs> like the idea of a creature being born, not exactly about inanimate phenomena arising and ceasing, but just the idea of oneself as having been born in that way. Now, yeah, because I want to do, I would like to do all three of these sisters. I'm going to jump to the last stanza of Chala's poem, but then I want to talk more about this idea of birthlessness. So the last stanza of her poem reads, as to those beings who fare amidst form, and those who abide in the formless, not having understood cessation, they come again, they come again to renewed existence. So back in, let's see. Yeah, when we read Vijaya's poem, the nun Vijaya, her poem also ended with as to those beings who fare amidst form and those who abide in the formless. But she said, and to all of their peaceful attainments, everywhere darkness has been destroyed. And it wasn't exactly clear, at least to me, what she was getting at regarding those who abide in form or even those who abide in formlessness. But then we come over to Chala and she says, so the meditators, all the deep meditators that are in a dhyana or a jhana, and therefore they are abiding in the realm of form, or even those who abide in the formless realm, she says they don't understand cessation, nirodha, and therefore they come again to renewed existence. So this is a very kind of important it's, a, it's actually going to be a theme for tonight, so I might as well just kind of state it ahead of time. We're dealing with the ideas of birth, of course, and then, like I said, the ideas of rebirth. And so we're dealing with the ideas of cyclical existence, what is called reincarnation. And the first thing that you need to understand is, and, and by the way, a great resource for this idea is there's this little Buddhist poem by Ashvagosha called the uh, the Sandra Ananda, the handsome Nanda. This is just a poem. It's not a sutra. It's not particularly in the canon, but it's a beautiful Buddhist poem. And it's about this uh, Nanda, not Ananda, just Nanda. And it's about Nanda's fixation and fascination with getting reborn in the heavens. So this monk, but it's before he's a monk. The story that's funny, he basically gets turned on to meditation because he's promised that he'll be reborn in these heavenly realms where he can basically do whatever he wants to do. And he's like, I want to be reborn in a heavenly realm where I can do whatever I want to do. So he ostensibly becomes a Buddhist, like shaves his head and does the meditation. But it's really just to get to heaven. He gets to heaven or actually he doesn't go. He, he gets taken to heaven for a moment so he can see what it's like. And just to kind of cut to the, the point, he basically... In going up to the heavenly realm, what he sees is that the gods and the goddesses, they too eventually fall back down into human or, or even lower existence. And Nanda, his realization in that poem is that even the gods continue to suffer and continue to fall back into cyclical existence. And so the point of that poem is to express how the Dharma, how Buddhism goes beyond ideas of heaven and hell. 
But you kind of need to keep in mind that in a traditional Indian culture where there's this kind of belief in reincarnation, the general idea is, no, you want to get a better rebirth and you want to avoid a low, bad rebirth. Buddhism comes along and says, no, actually, all of that is suffering, Every, all of it. So real liberation is moving out of the whole cyclical process altogether. Now, that is Nanda, and that's about the gods. What Chala is talking about is how even though you might be a great meditator and you've made it out of the suffering realm of desire, even though you're in the realm of form, or even if you're in the formless realm, you're still going to come right back down into cyclical existence again. So at that point, it's no better to be in a, in a dhyana than to be in a heavenly realm in that sense. And that's where she says this thing about those people, the people that are hanging out in the realm of form and hanging around in the formless realm, they don't understand nirodha. They don't understand cessation. So nirodha or cessation, of course, is this kind of really key Buddhist idea. It's very related to nirvana. In many, many instances, it's synonymous with nirvana in other instances it seems as if so nirodha or cessation is the cessation of the three poisons primarily of the afflictions so wanty greediness angry aversion and delusion about the nature of the self those three afflictions they can be brought to nirodha. They can be brought to cessation. Now, the idea is, or at least the way that I've read the commentary on all of this, it seems that if you get into a nice, juicy, meditative state, particularly in a formless realm, you can bring the afflictions, you can bring your greed, your anger, and your delusion. You can bring it to cessation. But then when you come out of meditation and kind of come back online, you could get angry again. You could get desirous again. Nirvana is the total blowing out of the afflictions. They're not coming back online ever. <laughs> so that's how I understand the relationship between Nirodha and Nirvana and why they're sometimes synonymous and why they are sometimes not synonymous. But Chala says, you know, that they don't really understand Nirodha. And therefore, they come again to renewed existence. And again, I don't want to dwell too long on just her poem, but a quick word about that idea. So we need to understand this particular affliction of the self. So let's kind of keep in mind that of the three afflictions, you've got this kind of, it's raga, uh, stimulation, wanting, craving, being kind of turned on. So there's that. And then there's dvesha, aversion, which could be angry, right? So we're angry or we want stuff. What we want to notice is, is that both of those movements, the movements of give me, give me, or the movement of get away from me, get away from me. Notice they are both predicated on the idea of a self that would want things and be satisfied by things, or that is averse to things and is pushing things away. So notice the kind of like, relationships between those three poisons my i personally find it very interesting to notice their relatedness in that way that if you have no self there's or no notion of self in that way there's not a lot of room for desire 
But also if you kind of work on that desire, it alleviates that delusion of self. Um, a quick word about this self idea. I want to remind everybody that when, or the way that I understand this teaching of no self, it's about this particular idea that we have of ourselves, which is the idea of me and my life. <laughs> Meaning there's a notion we have of ourselves that stretches back and begins the day we are born. The day I was born and then my life up till this point. What we want to notice is, is that they, there, there is a, um, a possessor, the, the one who had a life, that life, that idea. And what the, the Buddha or what Dharma, what Buddhism would sort of want us to notice is that if you actually think about that idea of a self, the one that the self that was a baby, the self that was an adolescent, the self that was a teenager, the self that was a young adult, the self that is an adult. So there's all these kind of versions. And then what we have the idea is, is that they were all versions of me. Okay. Versions of what? And that's where the delusion lies, that there is a kind of me that was a baby, that was an adolescent, that was a young adult, that is an adult, versus there being this present experience right here, right now, that is arising right here, right now, based upon everything that you are currently in contact with and thinking about. So there's a self that's arising right now consciously in terms of all of that, but that consciousness can get completely obscured with this idea of me. Now, what now it hopefully my quick review of no self is clear. Because what I want to mention is, is this. Now that we know that, or at least the way that I understand the no self idea, it's about that particular delusion of the me. Not this, but that idea of me. And what we want to realize is that that me, that delusional sense of me, it has never existed. And therefore it already is in a state of nirvana. But the degree to which you're still clinging to the idea of me, that's you holding yourself out of a nirvanic state by that very idea. <laughs> so the idea is, is that to really understand cessation, it is not that there is a self that has then been brought to cessation. It's just the realization that there never was that self. And then that realization is what then liberates one or transcends birth and death. Because if you are, if you understand what I was talking about and you understand the idea of of this present experience right now, this present experience right now was not born decades ago. This present experience is arguably arising right now. And then we could get philosophical about the idea of what is arising. We don't need to do that. But I think you see my point about transcending birth is about, again, this realization that you were never born to begin with in that way. Okay. Any questions, comments, or ideas about chala and the idea of birth, not approving of birth? Yeah, no. Um, I'm 
I'm trying to understand why, or or I'm think I'm thinking of a few reasons why people in dhyanas and samadhis aren't aren't doing it. And it seems like one idea I have is that they're they're not they're in some way they're not present, like what you were just describing at this very moment. But but the other idea sort of seems like seems like there's a sort of striving to it, or a, it's a, there's a there's a wanting to get somewhere, which is then. <clears throat> future which is not being present I'm mm -hmm. wondering what you think about either of those i i failed to mention something so i it, okay be, it's gonna be important with our next nun so i might as well get get busy now <laughs> so if you don't know this really quickly Buddhism has a very interesting cosmology about where the kind of the world and the cosmos comes from. And they have an interesting cosmology about what where it goes. So the basic idea, if you don't know it really quickly, is that there's nothing. And then this vortex of wind sort of starts accumulating and on that vortex of wind there starts to develop condensation like a water disc and then on the top of that water disc there starts to form a earthly film and then that earthly film starts to sink down into the water disc and that creates a kind of friction that creates fire and now you have the four elements formed and now that you've got the four elements, you're going to have a world start forming. So a world forms, you get Mount Maru and all the, all the constellations and planets, everything gets formed. Then that world starts to get populated by creatures, populated by creatures that then start going through a rebirth, reincarnation process. And they eventually move all the way up into these heavenly realms. <clears throat> But then eventually the seven giant suns appear in the sky and they scorch the universe and they burn up everything all the way up to the first Dhyana heaven. And what that means is, is that in traditional cosmology, if you are in the second, third or fourth Dhyana or higher, meaning a formless realm, you avoid the great fire that consumes the universe. So then there are these meditators in the world of form. And when the world recreates itself, those meditators actually eventually fall down into the earthly realm and start to populate the world. But then those seven suns appear and they scorch everything again. And this process keeps happening Except after seven appearances of the seven suns, there's a giant flood that gets rid of everything up to the second dhyana and then all the way up to the third dhyana eventually. And what I'm getting at, Noam, is that there is this kind of idea in early Buddhism that if you got into a high enough meditative state, you could avoid the destruction of the universe. But what the Buddha realized or is said to have said is that nope, eventually, even the people in the highest dhyanas and even in the formless realms, they eventually keep coming back in that way. So the only real escape from samsara, like the actual cyclical process, is the Dharma in, that, in the way that we've been talking about. That's the quick backstory on that. Cool. All right. Any other questions, comments about Chala? All right. Now for our younger sister, Upa Chala. Um, Upa Chala. Once again, we're at Shravasti. Then in the morning, the Bikuni Upa Chala dressed went into town, begged for food, came back. Then she sat down at the foot of a tree for the day's abiding. 
Then Mara, the evil one, approached the Bikuni Upachala and said to her, Where do you wish to be reborn, Bikuni? And she said, I do not wish to be reborn anywhere, friend. Mara replied in verse, But there are the Trayavastimsha and Yama heavens, or Yama devas, and the devatas of the Toshita realm, devas who take delight in creating, and devas who exercise control. Direct your mind there to those realms, and you will experience delight. The Bhikkhuni Upachala replied, There are Tavatimsa and Yamadevas, and Devatas and the Tushita realm, Devas who take delight in, in creating, and Devas who exercise control. They are still bound by sensual bondage. They come again under Mara's control. All the world is on fire. All the world is burning. All the world is ablaze. All the world is quaking. That which does not quake or blaze, that to which worldlings do not resort, where there is no place for Mara, that's where my mind delights. Then Mara, the evil one, realizing that Bikuni Upachala knows me, sad and disappointed, disappeared right there. Okay, so we can see a kind of a continuation of ideas from the la from Chala to Upachala. Chala is talking about birth, and because Upachala is actually talking about rebirth. Mara asks, like, well, where do you want to be reborn? That's where, because of that, I personally would read Chala's poem as talking about, like, having babies, being, you know, birthing, and in a certain sense, one's own birth. But it's not until Upachala that we're talking about rebirth in that sense. And of course, given what I just said about cyclical existence and all of that, her answer should make perfect sense where she says, I don't want to re be reborn anywhere, friend. And of course, that's the big difference, be again, between Buddhism and other kind of Indian religious traditions where there is a desire to be reborn somewhere, somehow in that sense. Now, really quickly, I want to mention, I, so I was going to do a deeper cosmology thing here tonight. I just want you to know really quickly that I've talked a lot about it. I, I mention it a lot. It's this Buddhist view that's called the three realms, the realm of desire, the realm of form, and the formless realm. We were just talking a lot about the realm of form and the formless realm, but then there's the realm of desire, right? The realm of desire is the realm of wanting things, not wanting things. <laughs> the realm of your, of your wanting, of your craving in that sense. In Buddhist cosmology, the realm of desire, as you move up Mount Sumeru, the beautiful Mount Meru, this kind of axis mundi, this giant kind of mountain that's in the middle of the world, as you move up Mount Meru, there are these 33, which are the Tavatimsa, or uh, I forget how they're called in Sanskrit, Trayastrimsha, something like that, but the 33 heavens. So there's these 33 levels of heaven that encircle the summit of Mount Sumeru, and those 33 levels of heaven are the domain of a god named Indra. Indra is considered the god of the realm of desire. Indra has an infinite number of wives. He has, an, he has constant sex. He is just pure sensual desire. 
And his realm are the 33 levels of heaven. That's the Tavatimsa. And then at the top of Mount Maru, at the kind of the peak of the realm of desire, is the Yama heaven. Yama is a god who is the judge of the dead. Every creature that passes away, it is said that they go to the top of Mount Maru, where the King Yama, this particular god of the dead, weighs your merit, puts your merit on a scale, and then Yama says, oh, you're going down to a hell realm. Or Yama says, oh, you get to go higher up to a heavenly realm or, you know, a, a heavenly realm of desire. So that's the Yama heaven. Then there's the Toshita heaven, which is above the Yama heaven. And you should know that the Toshita heaven is where all Buddhas are born in their last rebirth before they descend to the world to become a Buddha. You should know, though, that Toshita is the realm of pleasure. And then there's two heavens higher than Tushita, the Nirmanarati heaven. And Nirmana means like a transformation body, like basically like a dream body. And the Nirmanarati heaven is where you get to make your own dream bodies and then just have fun. It's basically what Nirmanarati means. It's the the delightful realm of transformations. And if that weren't fun enough, their highest heaven in the realm of desire is called the Vaisha Vartin Paranarmita heaven, which is this wild word that means the control over others' emanations. And basically, if you get to this highest level of heaven, you don't even need to manifest these different bodies. Other gods basically put on a show for you. Okay. So it's basically like a, you know, an AI simulated VR world in that sense, where you just get to kick back and experience it. You don't have to program it or anything. So those are these really, really, you know, big realms of desire, heavenly realms of de desire that Mara is saying, what meditate focused on those, get reborn up in those heavenly realms, right? And then she says, nope, because all those devas, all those gods are still bound by sensual bondage. They come again under Mara's control. Really quickly, one more time. I, I said a lot about this last week. I want to just say it one more time, though. When it comes to Buddhism and this idea of sensual bondage, this idea of sensual craving, last week I spoke a lot about the, the difference between enjoying something, like enjoying it when it's happening, versus being in a state of mind that wants or needs something in order to be happy. And I wanted to, I, last week, I wanted to point out a big difference between those two things. Because for me, when Buddhism talks about the craving, the tanha, the wanting, I think about that one, which is the, this idea that I'm not happy now, but I could be if only I had blank. And so it's that idea. And so the thing about it is, is that if you have access to blank, whatever blank is, if you have access to it, that's one thing. But the problem is, is that when you don't have access to that thing anymore, you get irritable. And you can't enjoy yourself anymore because you have now been in, you are in bondage to that sensual pleasure. And last week, I wanted to spend a lot of time just pointing at how there's a way in which I know that we give ourselves these little sensual treats, 
but maybe without noticing the way in which we are enslaving ourselves to them in that way. And so given that approach to sensual pleasure, which is uh, in, from a certain Buddhist point of view, that wanting and that craving is actually suffering. From that point of view, upachala is like more desire? <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> I don't need extra desire up in the, you know, these higher heavenly realms in that sense. And then what's her reason for all of this? Because the world is burning. The world is ablaze. The world's on fire. The world's quaking. So if those ideas don't like sound familiar to you, I want to remind you also in the Samyutta Nikaya, if you happen to have this uh, collection, I'm jumping back to page uh 1143 but i just want to remind everybody that there is a sutta a very 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 important famous sutta that is normally called the fire sermon uh this is the aditya parayaya sutta aditya parayaya sutta the fire sermon and this is a really famous sutra because you know it's in here that the buddha says bhikkhus all is burning. And what bhikkhus is the all that is burning? The eyes are burning. Visible forms are burning. Visual consciousness is burning. The ears are burning. Sounds are burning. And then he goes through all six senses, all six sensory objects, all six sensory consciousnesses. And the refrain is that all of them are burning. Burning with what? Burning with desire. Burning with craving. So Upachala, if you ask me, is referencing that famous sutra, that famous sermon. Uh, that was on page 1143, Renata. And so that's the attitude, that's the, especially the early Hinayana Buddhist attitude towards the world, towards the senses, towards sensory objects, is that it's burning. It's like burning. <laughs> and if you get into that mentality, and what I mean is, is like, if you step, take a couple of steps back, I was talking about the self, no self idea a few minutes ago. And I was talking about how there's the, that idea of a self, like the me as a little kid. Let's get rid of that idea. Then there's the idea of this, meaning this present state of awareness that is the result, the emergent result of everything that you are currently seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, in contact with, and what you are currently thinking about. So all six of your sensory organs are plugged in to the sensory objects, and that connection, that sparsha, that contact with phenomena is giving rise to a conscious state of experience. But from a early Buddhist point of view, that conscious, that state of consciousness is utterly agitated. It is utterly actually fried by all of this stimuli. And you could look at it as being burning in that way of all of sensation being like a kind of burning and if you kind of get into that mentality, you'll want to close your eyes. <laughs> you'll want it to be quiet. You'll not want it to stink or smell. You won't want to really be eating anything in that way. And you'll ultimately kind of want to be in a sensory deprivation tank where you don't have any bodily sense of tactility so that your mind can eventually come to a rest. 
And so from an early point of view, they were really into sensory deprivation meditation because of this attitude towards sensation, that it was utterly burning and agitating in that way. So she says this idea that all the world is on fire, burning ablaze, all the world is quaking. That which does not quake, that which is not ablaze, that to which worldlings do not resort, where there is no place for Mara, that is where my mind delights. And the key word at that end is that idea of that's where my mind delights. Not up in the heavenly realm of the transformations, not there. I delight where there is no quaking, where there is no burning, right? And this really great line too, that which worldlings do not resort to. So everybody else is trying to get into the heavenly realms. Everybody else is trying to be first in line to get the newest whatever. I'm where the people aren't in that way. <laughs> so, okay. Questions, comments, answers, ideas about Upachala. All right. And now our little sister, Si Supachala. So also at Shravasti, no big surprise there. Then in the morning, the bhikkhuni Si Supachala dressed, went into town to beg for food, then came back. She sat down at the foot of a tree for the day's abiding. Then Mara, the evil one, approached the bhikkhuni, Sisupachala, and said to her, Whose creed do you approve of, bhikkhuni? And Sisupachala replied, I don't approve of anyone's creed, friend. And then Mara said in verse, Under whom have you shaved your head? You do appear to be an ascetic, yet you don't approve of any creed. So why wander as if you're bewildered? The bhikkhuni si supachala replied in verse saying, outside here, the followers of creeds place their confidence in views. I don't approve of their teachings. They are not skilled in the Dharma. But there's one born in the Sakyan clan, the enlightened one, without equal, conqueror of all, Mara's subduer, who everywhere is undefeated, everywhere freed and unattached, the one with vision who sees all, attained to the end of all karma, liberated in the extinction of acquisitions. That blessed one is my teacher. His is the teaching I approve. Then Mara the evil one, realizing the bhikkhuni Sisupacha knows me, sad and disappointed, disappeared right there. Okay, so we're sort of still part of this buildup of ideas that's been going. So now we're not talking about birth. We're not talking about rebirth into heaven. Mara kind of understands that these women are enlightened. And so he goes at it with this approach about, so if you're doing this then, and you, you do believe that there is an escape from samsara, and you do believe that women are capable of achieving it, and you're not afraid, and you don't want sensual pleasures of the world, if you've all of that, then whose teachings are you following? Whose creed do you approve of? And of course, this is why I love Buddhism. Because she says, no creed, none of them. Very, very powerful idea. Outside of here, around town, right? 
followers of creeds place their confidence in drishti, in views. I don't approve of their teachings. They're not skilled in the Dharma. So a quick word about views and being skilled in the Dharma. So a very important sutra that everybody should know of is the Brahmajala Sutra, the Brahma's Net Sutra. In the Diga Nikaya, the long discourses of the Buddha, it's sutra number one. It's often also sometimes called uh, what Buddhism is not. So that sutra is a really important sutra. Again, it's called the Brahmajala Sutra, Brahma's Net. Oh, and it's also, it has all these different names. It's also sometimes called the Sutra on the 62 Erroneous Views. And views, of course, is this idea of a drishti. And you've probably all heard me talk about drishtis before, so I won't say too much about them. But I do just want to remind you that the basic idea in the Brahmajala Sutta, the Buddha describes 62 worldviews. And these are views about where you came from and where you go after you die. And the Buddha basically says, well, there's some people and they teach that after you die, you go up to heaven and live with Brahma forever. There's other people that teach after you die, you get recycled, <laughs> you get reincarnated. But he says in the same sutra, he says, but there's other people that say, after you die, you just become food for flowers. That's it. No more rebirth. You don't go to heaven. You don't go to hell. No more rebirth. And the Buddha lists 50, however many other views. And at the end, basically at the end of the sutra, he says, oh yeah, and what I'm teaching, it's none of that. It's not a view. And why? Because I'm not asserting that there's a self to begin with. And therefore, I'm not saying anything goes to heaven or gets reincarnated or becomes food for flowers. So this teaching of no self that we've talked about tonight and this idea of the deathless or the idea of birthlessness, all of these ideas, they, they take out the subject. They take out that which would be reborn or that which wouldn't be reborn or that which would be otherwise. And so this puts Buddhism in a very unique position. And this is also stated in the Brahmajala Sutta. This puts Buddhism in this unique position of basically not having a view. And I know that it might sound like the whole no self thing is a view, but if you look at it very carefully, you realize it's it's not a view because there's nobody to hold that view. That's what they're saying. So it's a very, very subtle teaching about views. But the one thing that I want you to kind of like kind of grok, kind of get deep in, in a deep way, I want you to notice how Holding to a view is what leads to argument. It can lead to a lot more than argument if you've studied world history and the you know religious conflict. Having views leads to conflict, strife, violence, all kinds of things. And so what I want you to think about is what would it feel like, what would it be like to not hold to a view? What I want you to think about is, could you see yourself getting in a heated argument about something if you are not holding on to something as absolutely true in that way? 
or flip it around. What I want you to notice is the harder someone is grasping at a view, odds are the more argumentative and kind of they are in that way. So Buddhism recognizes that adhering to views, clinging to views is utterly problematic and it's utterly kind of delusional. And so those who are skilled in the Dharma don't hold to views. So that's an important thing to say right there. And now, <clears throat> actually before, I'm about to take a major, uh, I'm about to go off on a major tangent. So any questions, comments, or ideas about our young sister Chala here? Okay, <clears throat> so hopefully this next part, hopefully this is why you come to Dharma Doors. So <clears throat> I just want to go off for a second about um, <clears throat> it's the line, but there is one born in the Sakyan clan. The enlightened one without equal, conqueror of all. So they're talking about the Buddha. So you are probably aware that one of the names for the Buddha is Shakya Muni. The Muni, excuse me, the Muni, the sage of the Shakyas. Now, for me, when I was in graduate school, or actually when I was in undergraduate school and I first started studying Buddhism, I learned, probably like you learned, that the Buddha was from a clan or a group of people in a region of India called Magadha, and the clan were known as the Shakyas. And so when the Buddha became a great sage, a great Muni, he became known as the Shakya Muni. And indeed, that's his kind of the name, his Buddha name, it not Siddhartha Gautama. What I want to share with you, though, is I just got done reading this book. <clears throat> it's called Greek Buddha. It's by Christopher Beckwith here. And this is a fascinating book. If for anybody that's like kind of interested in Buddhist history, I highly recommend this book. I, de I devoured this book in, in like very quickly. It was so intriguing. It came out in 2015. And I just want to share this with you. This is totally anecdotal. I know this isn't for everybody, but this person, let me see if I can find the, so this Mr. Christopher Beckwith, he is a historian of Central Asia. He's a linguist and a historian of Central Asia. And he wrote a book about a very ancient Central Asian nomadic tribe that was once a kind of an empire of Central Asia. And they were known as the Scythians, Scythians. So the Scythians, S-C-Y-T-H, I-A-N, Scythian, the Siths were this group from, um, again, actually kind of more from Iran, Iran area all the way to Central Asia. Interestingly, this guy who is both, again, a linguist and a historian of the Scythian empire, he has a whole section about how basically the Scythians in Northern India were known as the Sakas. And he basically has a whole theory that if you were to ask me as a historian is well supported that the Buddha, or at least this title, the sage of the Shakyas, it should actually be the sage of the Sakas. And linguistically, it would seem that the Buddha was not Indian but was from a more northern, kind of more even northwestern region, or at least was from a people of northwestern region, again, known as the Scythians, and came into India. 
his theory is basically that this Scythian nomadic wanderer, Siddhartha, came to India, went to Bodh Gaya, and became enlightened, and then taught in India, but then also went back to Central Asia, went back to kind of the hometown, and taught there as well. And while I'm at it, I have to tell you this. It's so interesting. He has an additional theory. You have probably heard of the very famous Chinese poem, the Tao De Ching, Tao De Jing. And the author of the Tao De Ching is this kind of mysterious people, this mysterious person, Lao Tzu, Lao Tzu. So his thing, being a linguist, is he traces the name Lao Tzu, which literally in Chinese, Chinese means old child. So it's already a kind of a funny um, nickname. And everybody recognizes that it's a nickname. And in fact, we know what Lao Tzu, we know what his real name was. And it was something along the lines of Lao Tun. But then he does this whole linguistic thing where the character, the Chinese character for old should actually be this other character that's pronounced Gao, not Lao, but Gao. And the second character that's pronounced in modern Mandarin as Tun rewind about a thousand years, 2000 years, and it was pronounced Tum. And so it's a transliteration, he says, of Gautum. Gautama is what he says. That's right. He claims that Lao Tzu, the author of the Tao Te Ching, was actually Gautama Buddha, and that after he taught in India, he heads over to China, teaches a little bit of Buddhism in the form of the Tao Te Ching, and then goes back to where he was from. Now, if you know the legendary story of Lao Tzu, even in the legendary stories of Lao Tzu and the writing of the Tao Te Ching, he was not Chinese. He was supposed to have come from somewhere else, came to China, lived for a while, and then on his way out of town, was asked to say a few words of wisdom and therefore gave the people of China the Tao Te Ching. And if you read the Tao Te Ching, there's a lot of what appears to be kind of Buddhist ideas in there. If any of that was of interest to you, I highly recommend this book, Greek Buddha. Very fascinating. It's like some kind of really cutting edge scholarship in that way. Like this guy's like really in the fold of what's going on right now. So just want to mention that as a tangent away from this reference to the, the one born of the Sakya clan. Any questions, comments about that? I know that was a, yeah, no. <laughs> That's so, so interesting. It sounds like you're, you're, you think it's a good theory. I'm wondering, has anyone theorized that before for other reasons, or is this a first that you know of? There have been people who recognize similarities with. I recognize similarities. It's hard to scholar. ignore. Like, yeah. Yeah. But and if you're familiar with Chinese intellectual history, yeah. the Tao Te Ching sort of pops out of nowhere with those ideas too. I see. Yeah. And the, time, the timing is right. The timing is right in terms of when all of the Tao Te Ching was supposed to have been written and when this sage of the sakyas was supposed to have been around so who knows thank you yeah all right and with the couple of minutes that we have left thank you for indulging that tangent by the way speaking of the sage of the sakyas speaking of the conqueror of all and mara's subduer I want to talk about the two ways that the Buddha is described. Well, actually, I guess he's described a bunch of different ways here, but I want to talk about what it means to attain the end of all karma 
And then I want to talk about what it means to be liberated in the extinction of acquisitions. So the ending of all karma. So really quickly, in order to understand what that means from a kind of a Buddha logical point of view, like the logic of an enlightened being or the logic of enlightenment, you, we need to keep in mind that in the world of Buddhism, when they talk about karma, Buddhism has a very particular idea of karma. So karma, as you know, it means action and it means doing something or performing action either with the body, with your voice, or with your mind. So doing something, saying something, thinking something. That's called karma. But what you need to always keep in mind with Buddhism and karma, the idea of karma, karmic action, it always includes the idea of the result of that karmic action. So it's tricky for kind of English trained thinkers, because in English, we have cause and effect. And those are kind of two different things. But when it comes to karma, they are always sort of thinking simultaneously about the act and the result of that act. And it's kind of always a package deal. You don't get to just have an action without the result of that action. So important to keep that in mind that there's always that implication of the result of the action. But then where, where it gets really tricky is that in the world of Buddhist thinking, karma is very related to samskara. Samskara, this idea of the mental conditionings, habitual karmic action. So the thing that you need to keep in mind about samskara, normally, even myself, when I teach Dharma, normally when we talk about conditioning or samskara, we are talking about mental conditioning. But what I need you to know is that samskara or conditioning, it's always conditioning of the body, conditioning of the voice, and conditioning of the mind. And what I mean by that is this, kaya body, body bodily, kaya samskara. Bodily samskara are things like breathing. You, you do it all on your own, meaning it just happens. It is, in modern lingo, we would call it an autonomic response. You just do it. Blinking. Blinking is a bodily samskara. You don't need to think about it. It just happens. It's on autopilot. So your breathing is on autopilot. Your heartbeat is on autopilot. Your blinking is on autopilot. In fact, all of the behaviors of your body are on autopilot. They are samskaric. They are conditioned. You can also recognize linguistic language conditioning. And the idea of that is, and it's more subtle, but what you need to recognize is that there was a time when you couldn't read and there was a time when you couldn't talk. You couldn't express yourself as a baby. But eventually people started showing you symbols, right? People started being like, a, ah, uh, a, and you eventually got conditioned to the point where I can show you that and you don't need to think about it. You just know it's the letter A and in terms of speaking, you get to the point where you are so conditioned 
in the English language, for example, you are so conditioned, you don't have to think, wait, okay, what's the word for that? What's the word for that? What's the word for that? You just speak. But what we want to notice is, is that it is entirely habitually conditioned in that way. So your ability to cruise through a book and just read is a form of conditioning. And what I want you to notice right now is that in the same way that you are breathing, but you're not thinking about it, you read and speak without thinking about it. You just do it. Now, if you can understand how it is that your body is on autopilot and how your language structure is on autopilot, the next thing to realize is the way in which your very mind faculty and thinking is on autopilot. You are not having ideas, like you are not consciously being like, you know what? I'm going to think about this now. You know what? I'm going to think about this now. No. Thoughts just pop up and you experience them. So from a Buddhist point of view, karmic action of the body, karmic action of our voice, and karmic action of our mind is utterly conditioned. All of it. <laughs> Questions, comments, answers, ideas about that. My only point on that, by the way, is a Buddha has ended all habitual activity. Question about ending all habitual activity. Yeah, Lane, please. Thank you, Michael. Um, I have a question about thinking. And I have this thought every time you talk about like automated thinking. And I've become through meditation, very aware of my own automated thinking and can realize, Hey man, these thoughts aren't even mine. Like I don't agree with them and I didn't put them there and they're not even mine, but I'm also um, a scientist by profession. And so there are times when I am deliberately thinking about something and it really does seem like I am deliberately thinking about this gene and what it does and blah, blah, blah. So how do you, how do you parse that out? Um, I, I totally hear you. I think that there is, I think that, so a, a bunch of different things come to mind. One aspect in terms of what you said, Lane, is about we want to kind of really investigate this idea of I'm thinking regarding what we've talked about in terms of self or no self. And what I mean is, is that there's a phenomena taking place and there that phenomena, that, that experience can be interpreted in terms of I'm thinking about that, but that is a very, like um, another kind of very clingy, possessive way of thinking about an experience. For example, I can have the feeling that I'm deliberately playing a musical instrument, or I can kind of recognize that it's sort of happening and and the idea that I'm doing it is maybe an overlaying, if you know what I mean. And so my point is, is that I think that there is like utterly mindless activity that we are actually not, like you were saying before about thoughts that are not our own and thoughts that are coming from nowhere. So there is that, but that even at, a, at that deeper level of when we are actually being very mindful and are really on top of it, there's a way in which even that is going to be samskarically habitual in a certain way. And, and I think what this has a lot to do with is, um, oh, it's so it's a little late to actually even open all of this up because it's an amazing question, Lane. Um, yeah, I think it's sort of about 
not so much about agency. I know it sounds like we're kind of talking about agency. And I do think that what we want to look at, the one thing that I can say regarding agency, agency is such an interesting idea. You know, it's plagued philosophers forever, this idea of free will and agency and like what exactly that is. And I know that I know that there's a way in which we, especially modern um, people, maybe modern thinkers, I know that there's a way that we can associate agency with a kind of idea of freedom. We even call it free will. And so when we hear about just everything being on autopilot and being habitual, I know that there can be this reaction of like, I don't know if I want to believe that because then it's going to take my freedom away. And I think what we need to kind of recognize is that there sort of is a, a difference between, I guess for lack of a better term, it's not even, it's not a very good term. I can't think of a better way to put it though, but there is a sort of what would be called bearing witness, which would be different than being confused about ideas of agency and self and all of that. And that idea, delusions of agency, delusions of self and all of that is not be just bearing witness. <clears throat> it's actually thinking that you have agency and then wondering why it feels like I have no agency. <laughs> Versus a sort of a way, and it sounded like, Lane, when you described your maybe, you know, deep thinking about something, deep thinking about genes, and that there can almost be this kind of bearing witness to the thinking about genes. And I would suggest kind of looking at that as a degree of liberation and freedom where there's just the observing of it without a sense of agency, because that sense of agency might be a false overlaying in that way. We will continue that conversation though, Lane, because that's a great question. And, and I know we are often thinking about thinking in, in Dharmador. So yeah, journey. Yo. Um, I thought it was a great question too. And one thing that came to mind for me is um, like as a scientist, like there is a long lineage of scientists and scientific method and and all of these things and so while your thinking may be very like individual to you it is also conditioned by like a deep tradition of scientific thought and so forth that's that's what came to mind for me great comment jeremy excellent Yeah, I actually had that thought while you were answering my question. I was like, oh, I was just conditioned in grad school how to do this. Okay, got it. Yay. Awesome. <laughs> well, that was fruitful. Very cool. Um, yeah, and then that pretty much and that's the kind of the end of that poem. We didn't really get to talk totally about liberated in the extinction of acquisitions. But I think we did actually get around to that a little bit in terms of appropriating a lot of different things in that sense. And that a Buddha doesn't appropriate. He is fully liberated in the extinction of acquisitions. So it's a great way of thinking about a Buddha. So. All right, everybody, unless there's any last uh, questions, comments, answers, ideas. That was an awesome Dharma doors. I'm super happy to have all those great questions. Cool. Um, no, anything? Oh yeah, Ron, please. Okay, there we go. Hi. Hi. Uh, you just You just mentioned that we will continue that conversation and, and I, I'm wondering it, 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 next week or because I'm very interested mm -hmm. in, in uh, where we landed here. Yeah, and I, it will be next week because 
and I'm actually I'm I'm beginning to realize that these ten nun poems. I don't know. I think they are well um, put together because these ideas keep rolling right into the next one. So mm -hmm. the next nun is being asked about by whom has this puppet been created, meaning the person. And so it's entirely about the idea of agency and all of that. So it, it, perfect well, segue. Good. good. Yeah. Um, it's it just brings Sam Harris's uh, discussion on free will uh, into the forefront of my mind. I mean, he, if if you if you all haven't heard Sam Harris talk about the illusion of free will, especially what I was talking about in terms of ideas, he does a great um, a spiel on it. I don't know how else to put it. So, yeah, thanks. Yeah, man. All right, everybody. That's it for tonight.